Hi, everyone. Uh, it's uh, May 17, 2021. Welcome to a new installment of our department's research seminar. This is the Department of Theoretical Philosophy at the University of Bucharest. Uh, and the research seminar is organized jointly with CELFIS. This is the Center for Logic, Philosophy, and History of Science at the University of Bucharest. Uh, we're delighted that you could join us. Um, and I should also mention that uh, this seminar series is sponsored by the local public funding agency for research. This is with Fiskadi via project, and I believe I've learned this by heart by now. It's uh, PN-3 Roman dash uh, PD-1.1-2019-0535, and we're very grateful to our public sponsor. And tonight's speaker is uh, Dana Jalobano. Uh, Dana is a fantastic member of our department, and we're delighted and grateful that she could join us. And her talk is titled Bubbles, Bladders, and the Folds of Matter on the Interplay Between Experimentation and Metaphysics in Baconian Natural and Experimental Histories. Dana, thanks so much, and take it away. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, Andre, my apologies for not being enough present this semester. I'm paying now my debt. And in honor of the seminar, I kind of put together a first draft of a paper. Uh, so apologies to everyone. It's going to be long and boring, as I said. And as any first draft, it's all going to be also messy. But it's a kind of research that I it made me very enthusiastic over the past couple of weeks, I think, maybe even months. And it's also connected with a research project that I began this year, a research project that is supposed to investigate the, the passage, let's say, from recipes to scientific experiments. Um, this paper is an investigation into a curious and characteristic feature of 17th century Baconian natural and experimental histories namely, the intricate interplay between theoretical, speculative layers and practical matters of fact, experimental investigations in contemporary terminology. And because we are at the uh, seminar in history and philosophy of science, somehow one can say that the questions that I'm going to address here regards things like theoretical engagements or metaphysical commitments. But um, no, I haven't started the slides. I will start the slides in a moment. I just wanted to make a bit of an introduction. As I will try to see to show in what follows, talking in this contemporary term terminology can be misleading. Baconian natural histories, as some of you well know, are complex and I would say insufficiently investigated structures, and it would be an oversimplification to divide them into layers under the model of contemporary philosophy of science. And yet, if we have to put forward a kind of grossly oversimplified picture um, and we imagine a sort of continuum having metaphysical principles on one end and hands-on experimentation on the other end, what I'm claiming is that in between these two ends there are several layers of theoretical entities. And the question is how do these layers interact. To date, most scholars tended to address such questions top down, assuming from the beginning a type of connection. For example, the hypothetical deduct the deductive structure of argumentation or mechanisms of reintroduction or some principle of similarity. The problem with this attitude is it, that it tends to disregard precisely what I take to be most interesting in this Baconian natural and experimental history, histories, namely the diversity of experimental practices, the diversity and complexity of experimental practices. In the case of Francis Bacon, the question of this interplay between speculative metaphysics and his experimental program is one of the most difficult questions and most discussed questions in contemporary scholarship. But I think that the same can be extended to other natural histories as well. And the one that I'm going to allude to today is a kind of natural history in the making that was characterized at some point at the end of the 17th century as the natural history of the air, 
uh, kind of pet project of the Royal Society. Uh, in a series of papers about Bacon, I have argued that the way to address this question of the interplay between theoretical layers and uh, practices um, can be addressed uh, in terms of, or it's better to be addressed in, on particular cases and looking at particular um, experimental practices. And then by looking at those particular cases, we can see that experimental practices for Bacon are both metaphysically informed and, and that's more important, they provide feedback mechanisms for theoretical changes and emendations of the theory. And this I will also show today, which it's also one of these kind of papers working on an example. This happens at the level of concept formation. Today I would look a uh, at a class of experiments which became extremely popular in the part of, in the second part of the 17th century. They are experiments involving bladders and bubbles. And here I can start perhaps sharing the screen. Oops, this one. Um, today it's scholars subsumed most of the examples I'm going to talk about to larger classes, talking about hydrostatic experiments, barometric experiments, Torricellian experiments, or perhaps experiments with a vacuum. A less present this way to look at them is to see them as investigations relating to the assembling of a natural and experimental history of the air. Um, and what is, okay, so, uh, sorry, that's um, I. Th th what is frustrating about about uh, talking in this way is that I would have very much liked to draw these things on the blackboard, and I tried to draw them on the slides, and as you can see, the result is awful. But the point is that the kinds of experiments I'm talking about can be done in the Torricellian tube, and here you have a very rude depiction of how you obtain the Torricellian tube, and they have been done. Uh, in the Torricellian tube or in the vacuum pump. Uh, inflated bladders were carried up on Pascal's Predatome experiment. In London, the virtuosi carried bladders on the top of Westminster Cathedral, submerged them in water, and indeed mines. Bladders were used to investigate the turning of water into air and the investigation of respiration. There were many experiments in the anatomy and physiology of bladders themselves on their permeability and elasticity, and on their potential use for storing air and for producing air or contributing to the production of air. In what follows, I propose to look at these experiments, focusing not so much on the theory they're supposed to demonstrate, but on the experimental practices one can reconstruct from the experimental recordings we have. As, as we shall see, this experiment, this, um, no, how do I go back? As we shall see, these experimental recordings are extremely diverse. They use different experimental setups and methodologies, so they often construct different phenomena and point to different results. And of course, propose diverging explanations. And to date, this diversity was often covered up by historians' presuppositions regarding the use and function of these experiments. I will show what we can gain if we attempt to uncover the details of experimenting with bladders and bubbles. Now, unlike the barometric tube or the vacuum pump, bladders are instrument non-familiar to our modern eye. So much so that one often needs help to imagine what these exper exper experiments actually do. But as we shall see, 17th century naturalists experienced similar problems when faced with these experiments. They had to figure out first what the recipe was talking about. Then they had to assemble materials for trying it out. And, you know, getting enough bladders from pigs and goats and fish and other animals, it's not the same as getting a couple of, uh, I don't know, chemical paraphernalia or glass tubes. Um, 
and I try to understand them and then perhaps developing them further. Again, bladders and bubbles are non-standardized instruments which allow substantial variation from one particular context to another. This is why instead of talking about replication and reproduction, I think it is useful to think when we discuss the experiments I'm going to discuss in terms of enactment. Similarly with the case of enacting a recipe, in the case of these experiments, there is a wide latitude of choice um, displayed in, we will see in, in various ways of enactment. And I'm going to distinguish between something called imaginary enactment, which is very similar with what the historian is doing when trying to figure out what is happening in a particular experiment. And we are going to do a lot of imaginary enactment today. And the other way of enacting, I call performative enacting or enactment. And this involves an actual try, trial. Enactment is very context dependent. And I will show in what follows how varying the context and sources transform these experiments throughout the 17th century. Bladder experiments are traveling from England to France, in Holland and from there back to England. We can find them in Francis Bacon, Phenomena University and Historia Densierari and Silva Silvarum. But we can also find them in the writings of Pascal Mersenne and Robert Wall in the 1640s. In the writings of Boyles in the 1660s, but also in Hooks and in the memo in all sorts of correspondence and philosophical transactions and all the papers connected with the Royal Society. In fact, my impression this week was that once one starts looking, then it looks like animal bladders are some of the most popular instruments of the 17th century experimentation. They are traveling very well, they adapt from one particular context to another, and they were able to accommodate many different matter theoretical and metaphysical explanations. Actually, people have wondered in the past how to explain the popularity of these experiments, even if we take them to mean, you know, the Torricellian experiments, experiments with air and void. Why were people doing this from 1640s when Torricelli invented the barometer all the way up to the 17th century? This is a serious challenge for those regarding bladder experiments as belonging to the prehistory of Boyle's law because you know, Boyle's law was kind of discovered in 1662. Why another 20 years of such experiments? A similar cha challenge faces those subsuming these experiments under the debates over vacuum. Puzzled, some scholars have argued that these experiments gradually lost some of their knowledge production function um, and became rhetorical devices in the attempt to display a novel public face of science. Others pointed out to their simplicity and adaptability to contexts, ending, extending from anatomical and physiological research to discussions of rarefaction and condensation, from the nature of air to that of the version or transmutation of air into water, or of water into air. The fact is that every each of these contexts, in every each of these contexts, these experiments display the rich and complex interplay. I want to investigate. And I'm going to concentrate especially on rarefaction tonight. Um, so what is important to, to kind of have as a starting point and, and, re and remember while I'm going to give you all sorts of details is that when we read about these experiments, we face rather vague and sometimes ambiguous and sometimes impossible recipes. Um, which means, as we shall see, that one has to do a lot of preliminary interpretative and practical work to figure out what one has to do in order to enact these experiments. And I will try to show in what follows that in this interpretative work, we can see a remarkable mobilization of resources, speculative as well as methodological. So I'm making three claims here tonight. First, I claim that thinking in terms of enactment can vary, can be very helpful to understand what, uh, what early natural philosophers were doing in the laboratory. 
And this, and in this particular case, extremely helpful to disentangle complex and offered quite different investigations that historians so far tended to conflate under the generic terms of Torricellian experiments or experimenting with the void. Second, I claim that once we start discussing about what these experiments are doing, the Baconian context is very useful and insightful. As I said, they are very sensitive to context. This context, the Baconian context, I will kind of suggest the changes in the 1660s. Here I have a very spec big speculative relief that I'm going to throw on the table because some of the um, some of some of those presents know, present know much more about this than I do. So I'm also going to just speculate a bit of why why this Baconian context is so important in the 1660s. In the experiments performed by Boyle and Hooke we can detect two relevant features of what I mean by the Baconian context. Namely, the attempt to collect and classify experiments under theoretically defined headings and topics of inquiry, and, and something which has been kind of done and shown so far, and something else and more important, uh, the, the, way of, at the way of looking at these experiments as starting points for experimental inquiries as attempts to develop experimental investigations starting from particularly fruitful or enlightening experiments, what Bacon calls the instances of special power. Now, the third claim is that if we proceed in this bottom-up manner uh, that I said will be long and boring, uh, we will get valuable insight into the interplay between metaphysics or, you know, let's say very theoretical, very abstract layers and uh, science. The, the interplay which takes place mainly at the level of concept formation. I want to show that these experiments with bladders lead to the development of a number of intermediate concepts and explanations, which, however, are not all on the same level. One can see a hierarchy of intermediate concepts, some closer to practice, and therefore some that can be defined in operational terms, other closer to various intermediate causes and taking into consideration matter theoretically informed explanations. At this very kind of theoretical level, what I'm saying is trivial. What I'm saying is if, if you proceed bottom up, paying a bit more attention to experimental practices and enactment, you will see that the landscape of concept formation is much more sophisticated and complex than before. That's not much, but um, perhaps the details will be a bit more interesting. And true to the model that I'm going to show here, um, and the fact that I'm trying to bridge the gap between abstract and speculative questions regarding concept formation, explanation, and modeling, um, and extremely down to earth questions regarding imaginative and perform performative enactment, let me start with some of the latter. And Let's have a look at something that looks very much like an impossible experiment. Robert Wall's carp bladder experiment must have been very, really impressive since many people claimed to have seen it and some even to have successfully tried it. The experiment is described by Mersenne, by Gassendi, by Henry Power, by, and by Robert Boyle, or referred to by Power and Robert Boyle. And yet it reads very much like a problematic, perhaps even impossible experiment. Robert Hall claims that he has cut half, uh, in half a fish swimming bladder, that he has pressed the half to take out the air, that he has dried it, and then tied it with a string so that the minuscule quantity of air remaining inside cannot get out. Then he claims he inserted the deflated bladder in a tube in which he poured liquid mercury. Then he reversed the tube, creating the Satoricellian barometer. Um, and he claims that what happens is that as the mercury descends in the Torricellian tube, the fish bladder, which remains hanged here on the upper part of the tube, inflates. The little remaining air expands dramatically inside of the Torricellian void. The way in which this experiment is usually presented in the secondary literature is this. Robert Val illustrates in it what happens in the Torricellian void 
the air in the bladder, freed from the pressure of the external air, expands forcefully. The reader can admire, and that's somehow of the, uh, the 17th century readers are admiring uh, the beautiful experiment and the surprising fact that look, the air has an inner power of rarefaction and that this power of rarefaction acts equally in all directions. Hence, the bladder is round, well, almost round. But is this experiment at all possible? What happens if we pour an almost one meter long column of mercury over a dry fish bladder containing a bit of air? The first surmise, and here I'm talking purely about imaginative experiments. I haven't tried, I would like to, but I'm just kind of imagining and I would like you to imagine along with me. So first hypothesis is that the bladder bursts and the bubble of air is released in the Torricellian space. Another possibility since apparently the bladder is dried is that it's not impermeable to begin with and hence it doesn't burst but doesn't contain any air therefore it doesn't inflate. Or even if it does inflate it doesn't inflate like here and in any case it doesn't become round because it wasn't round to begin with it's very elongated. Now it would help to look at Robert Wall's actual text because it has a number of peculiarities. First, the tube is not the standard Torricellian tube. That would be the standard Torricellian tube. Um, the experimental setup is like this. So the bladder was empty nearly all of nearly all the air. The air, a thread was tied around the neck, and it tied it so it tied it so tight that it could not let out its air nor admit any. This was then placed in the tube in which we had previously placed small birds and mice. The superior part of it uh, has the capacity of a goose egg. Placing the bird, placing birds inside of the Torricellian tube clearly needs a different experimental setup than the simplified one I kind of tried to draw for you. Um, and it's not at all clear how you do this with birds unless you do it with water. Um, something which seems to square with Robert Wallner claim next. So this being prepared, I made this experiment using mercury as if, of course, it can be done with water as well. So that the space of seeming vacuum appear as usual at the upper part of the tube which held the bladder. Um, but to the complete astonishment of the bystanders, the bladder appeared quite turgid and distended, just as if it was still inside of the carp's belly, for in fact, that very small amount of air which remained in it liberated at last from compression, being in a position in which it has no longer compressed, neither by our condensed air nor, nor by the surrounding bodies, has expanded itself to the size which the bladder would permit. And with the inclination of the tube, the mercury was sucked back, the bladder became flaccid, just as if its, its air was exhausted. And upon, so if you incline the tube and then put it back again, you see the bladder inflating and deflating, he claims. Uh, okay, great. But then comes really something really unexpected, which shows that the reader, it shows the reader that the setup is much more complex than what we have imagined so far. Robert Valls describes the next step of experiment in one, in, in which one, oops, um, intentionally lets air inside of the barometric chamber to see how the bladder deflates. This is done, we are told, by perforating the pig's bladder, which closes the upper end of the tube with a fine needle. So in Robert Valls experiment, we have not one, but two bladders. A pork or goat bladder seals the upper part of the tube, tube and a fish bladder inflates, infl inflates inside of the tube. As I've said, when we try to figure out what happens in an experiment, the context is important. And Robert Wall presents this experiment after another, much more easy to imagine and extremely familiar to everyone who ever experimented with inverted tubes. The experiment with the bubbles of air. If in inverting the tube, a bubble of air is let inside the Torricellian chamber, the mercury is pushed down. 
In fact, this probably happens nine out of 10 trials. And we will see in what follows that, for example, Robert Boyle claims it happens every time when you do the experiment, if one merely pours mercury into the tube, as we are told we should do. You have to do all sorts of tricks so that you don't get bubbles at the end. Bubbles are ascending to the mercury and they enter into the barometric cham chamber. However, Robert Weil exploits this common failure and turns it into an interesting experiment. He introduces in the barometric chamber equal volumes of air and water. And he observes that in the tube, in the tube that contains both air and water above the mercury, the level of mercury is higher. Sorry. Yes, the level of mercury is higher. I might even have a drawing. Here it is. So in the, in the tube in which you have both water and air, the level of mercury is higher than in the tube which contains air only. So there's a surprising effect. The bubble of air pushes the mercury down more than the combined weight of air and water. This means that what pushes the mercury down is not the weight, but something else. And he calls that something else, the power of rarefaction. The power of rarefaction is thus, quote, a natural property of the air to expand spontaneously into any space available to it and to press on any surface that prevents it in doing so. The power of rarefaction is something characteristic for air something that water do not possess. Now, from this perspective, the Karp's bladder experiment is an illustration of this power and something the reader can imagine after he witnessed or reproduced the bubble experiment. So what I'm saying is that, that this experiment is easy to enact imaginatively as well as uh, performatively. And then by extending from this one, you can imagine what happens in the other one. Now, in my talk so far, okay, so I have seen, I, I have said this so far, but it's good to, so the experiment is presented as performing a more visual effect and illustrating the supplementary force at work. Now, so far I have used Robert Wall text, but the drawings are coming from a different source the account of someone who claims to have witnessed the experiment in person. Jean Pequier, Experimenta Nova Anatomica, Paris 1651, was translated into English in 1653 and became one of the main sources of such experiments in England. As Charles Webster has shown a long time ago, it was, it was through Pequier that knowledge of Robert Wall's experiments was diffusing among the virtuosi uh, such as Henry Power or Robert Boyle. And here is how Pequet chose to record the carp bladders experiment. First of all, he changes the order of experiments and begins with the carp bladder experiment and not with the bubble experiment. He claims from the title that the experiment shows or displays the rarefactive elatory of the air, elatory being his name for the power of rarefaction. Then he gives a slightly modified account of the experimental setup. I suggest to read this in the key of the imaginary enactment. He claims that the tube is open on both ends. And this is the drawing that Pequet has. So the tube is to begin open on both ends. And this is how you insert the bladder on the uh, uh, bulky end. And then seal it with the straight bound thread here in B. And then add on the top a pork bladder, which supposed to, supposedly seals uh, the bladder further, and he goes out of his way to say that pork bladders stop the best passage of the quicksilver. Then one fills the tube to the brim with quicksilver, and then inverts it into the glass. 
Now one wonders why does this ending has to be soft and made of threads and pork bladders as opposed to hard made of glass. Is the solution of combina combinating thick thread and pork bladder, presumably both elastic, a solution that prevents crushing the fish bladder? I have no idea again, but one can perhaps imagine that this is the case and that they are introduced in the experiment precisely for this purpose. In any case, Pequet describes the effect in a language different from Robert Wall. And the language is interesting. A wonderful sight appeared to beholders, to the beholders. The calf's little bladder, which the straightness of the narrow neck kept up in the higher bottle, did of his own accord swell again. Indeed, I had been amazed, except my mind had cured the errors of mine eyes, at the swelling fullness of that sudden meteor in point C. You saw that. Oops. Yeah, in point C here, that's, that's the sudden meteor in the middle, as they say, of vacuity. But the residue of air within the secret passages of the withered indeed, but not altogether exhausted bladder, thought there was a spontaneously, spontaneous elatry in the air, whilst free and not compressed by the weight of anything lying above it. Okay, so first he claims that the bladder swells again of its own accord. Then he describes it as a meteor, namely a property of atmospheric air, and insists on its roundness. He also claims that the meteor floats, as it were, in the middle of the barometric chamber. This floating business, I'm not going to show you, but I have found it in, in Henry Power, for example, which eliminates the thread and claims that that the inflated bladder floats on the surface of mercury. Um, moreover, Pequet seems to indicate that one can observe two effects here, the swelling of the bladder and the pushing down of the mercury. It clearly appears that the air, which after writing lay fast in the most inward places of the bladder, did dilate the skin thereof by its incited elatory in the falling, falling down of the quicksilver. Likewise, it appears that the air which was pressed to the inward superficies of the wall by the metallic weight, as did stay enclosed in the outwards folds of the vesicle, was, in, was enough by the virtue of the same elatory to fill now the whole vial. In Pequet's imaginative enactment, this experiment is neither an experiment about the atmospheric pressure, nor one about the void. He clearly assumes that the air has weight is agnostic about the void, but the experiment does something different. It shows that air has this inner power of rarefaction he calls elatory. This is a special property of the air, a property that water and mercury do not have. Hence the reference to a meteor, presumably one can witness something similar in the terrestrial atmosphere if uh, and when the upper strata of the atmosphere are ratified. In addition, the experiment shows that unlike gravity, or weight, this power of rarefaction is isotropic, acts in all directions. As Chalmers has pointed out, the power of rarefaction and elatory are this sort of technical intermediate concepts introduced to describe uh, a, an intermediate causal uh, explanation uh, introduced in the uh, description of the air and the property of the air to resist pressure. They mark the moment when hydrostatic explanations, which so far were based on weight only, um, now are replaced or branched off into pneumatic explanations in which forces at play are both weight and elasticity. Um, and, and this new properties such as fluidity of the water and elasticity of the air are expressed in terms of new concepts. And a third concept from this category is boiled spring of the air. But perhaps we can see that developing bottom up as well. Uh, but this time, instead of imaginative enactment, 
we might have something more like a performative enactment. So these three concepts somehow can be seen as developing out of these experiments as the extra force the bubble of air has here. And it's in general a force of responding to external pressure. And as you can see, if weight pushes downwards, this elatory or spring of the air pushes in all directions. Now, okay, let's have a look at some performative enactment because in the vacuum pump, one can do the carb bladder experiment without any of the difficulties I've been enumerating above. One simply places the disinflated bladder in the receiver and observes that as the operator extracts the air, the bladder gradually inflates. And here is how Boyle describes the enacting. And this time, I think we can call it a performative enactment. So we took then a lamb's bladder as large. This time is not the small fish bladder, well dried and very limber and leaving it about in about uh, leaving in it about half much air as it could contain we caused the neck of it to be strongly tied so that none of the included air though by pressure could get out this bladder being conveyed into the receiver and then covered then the cover looted on the pump was set to work and after two or three exactions of the ambient air the imprisoned air began to swell in the bladder and as more and more of the air in the receiver was from time to time drawn out, so did the bladder more and more expand itself and display the folds of the formerly flaccid bladder. So that before we had exhausted the receiver near so much as we could, so you know, way before there is any void in, inside, the thing is very much inflated. And uh, there are many such experiments in Boyle's new, experiment, new experiments on the spring of the air and subsequent works. Now, note first that Boyle simplifies and clarifies the details, drawing the reader's attention to the balance of forces. As the air is driven out, its spring decreases, the air in the vacuum pump, and the stronger spring of the air remaining in the bladder prevails. And Boyle also emphasized another aspect of this enactment, stating that this experiment is much of the same nature with that which was some years ago said to be made by that eminent geometrician, Monsieur Roberval, with a carbs bladder emptied and conveyed into a tube and so on and so forth. So he acknowledges that he is performatively enacting Roberval's experiment, but somehow that makes it almost unrecognizable because first Boyle transforms it into an investigation of he has a number of steps. First is a sort of investigating the experimental setup. Uh, for example, Boyle performs the experiment with bladders of different dimensions and providence. Fish bladders, goat bladders, pork bladders, and so on. Some dry, some fresh, some dipped in water. In some cases, he describes experiments in which three different bladders are put inside of the receiver of different dimensions. He varies the conditions. One experiment suggests, for example, that out of the three different bladders, one is pierced and hence is completely flask to begin with, and the other is loosely tied and it, at, it, at its neck, and hence it's permeable. In order to see whether inflation is only due to the expansion of the enclosed air, or whether some of it at last is due to the elasticity of the bladder itself. Again, we have the elasticity or spring of the air, but bladder is an elastic material. Why shouldn't that inflate or whatever, stretch or whatever of its own accord? A set of experiments deal with what looks like the main difficulty of the experiment, the fact that most bladder, bladders burst. And again, we see a failed experiment turn into a relevant feature of the phenomenon, because the conclusion is that all bladder burst well before there is any void in the receiver. So just a little depression of the receiver immediately provokes the bladders to inflate. 
in this manner and through experimental investigations, Boy completely changes the meaning of the bladder experiment, eliminating vacuum from the picture is not interesting anymore. We don't have to bother about it. It is not because of vacuum that bladder inflates. The bladder inflates as soon as there is a difference between the spring of the air enclosed in the pump and the spring of the air enclosed in the bladder. In fact, as he clearly shows, the bladder experiments are not good instruments to deal with the question of vacuum. One needs stronger glass devices or something else. And yet, bladders do not get abandoned as instruments. And one can find them and one can find them the in use well into the last decades of the, 18th, of the 17th century. And this is not only because they seem to display the powers of air and you know, because they make a fun experiment, it's also because they are handy when one wants to do computations of the quantity of matter and forces at play in the phenomenon of rarefaction and condensation. Experimenting with bladders can help distinguishing and differentiating between the weight of the air and its spring or elator. And here is how Bacon defines the elator. And I think that's kind of interesting. It's usually said, okay, this is a kind of very carefully defined operational concept or intermediate concept. But, and, however, what is interesting is what, what is in italic there. So, by spring of the air or later, that which I mean is that our common air either consists or at least abounds with, and that's very important, either consists or at least has some particles, parts of such nature, that in case they be bent or compressed by the weight of the incumbent parts of the atmosphere or by any other body, they do endeavor as much as in them lies to free themselves from that pressure by bearing against the contiguous bodies that keep them bent. And so on. The spring is thus partly a resistance to external pressure where pressure, following yeah, Chalmers, is the external pressure exercised by the weight of the air or surrounding bodies. Meanwhile, there seems to be in this property something else in addition to the mere resistance to pressure, something spontaneous, the second part of the definition. A sort of inner force of at least some particles to expand their sphere. In Robert Wall's terms, a power of rarefaction. So if, you know, if external force is not, uh, doesn't act upon air, air still has the tendency to expand. It is, it is worth pausing here a bit to reflect the use of this explanatory vocabulary. First of all, that elator, um, Pequet's term and spring of the air are often used indistinguishable and Boyle also uses the term sometimes power of self-dilation or power of rarefaction. Um, oops, sorry. He claims that his business is not to assign the adequate cause of the spring of the air, but only to manifest that the air has a spring and to relate some of its effects. And yes, what it is supposed to, and, and yet what is, what is this supposed to mean is not entirely clear. First of all, because as we have seen, Boyle's attempt is not so much to show, illustrate and manifest the spring, but much more to clarify and compute it in diverse situations, to distinguish it from weight and to determine its properties. In 1669, in the continuation of new experiments, Boyle makes a statement which can leave room for different interpretations. He states again that he is explaining phenomena, phenomena in terms of the weight and the spring of the air, ending with a statement, quote, though I deny not that other causes may contribute to the pressure of the air, which I take to be gra the grand and immediate agent of this phenomena. I suggest that there are two elements in, discussion regarding, in the discussion regarding the spring of the air, which need supplementary uh, clarification. One is its apparent spontaneity, which seems to point towards a non-mechanical aspect of elasticity, namely not reducible to particles in motion. 
The other is boyle cautious attitude, which leaves open the possibility that between the motion of two particles generating pressure and the phenomenal level one introduced, one can introduce other intermediate causes besides the weight and the spring of the air. As it is well known, Boyle ultimately conceptualized his phenomena in terms of mixtures of particles. He often lists hypotheses regarding the nature of springy particles, but he clearly emphasizes the provisional role of such matter theoretical descriptions, often formulated in metaphorical terms. Springy particles are perhaps like as many minuscule springs of a watch, as Hook wants to say. They can be long elastic threads, like threads of the wool, or something like wood shavings, curly particles that can unfold if liberated from the external pressure. What Boyle seems to say is that regardless of which of these models, let's say, is closer to reality, the experimenter still faces difficult problems when asked to calculate and compute the relative strength of weight and spring in various situations, because and here the bladder experiments are again extremely useful, the air has this natural tendency to form bubbles and expand each time uh, the external pressure diminishes. In the new experiments, Boyle has a whole set string of enactment of the Torricellian experiments in which the attention is focused on the bubbles of the air, which can hardly be prevented to ascend in the barometric chamber. That's not boil, but I couldn't do better from home. But oftentimes upon the opening and the inverted tube into the vessel mercury, you may observe a bubble of air to ascend from the bottom of tube through the subsiding quicksilver to the top. And almost always you may, if you look narrowly, take notice of a multitude of small bubbles all along inside of the tube, the wicks, the quicksilver and the glass, many of which upon the quicksilver forsaking the upper part of the tube do break into that deserted space where they find little or no resistance. And so I suggest that we have here another intermediate explanation of the spring elatory or the power of expansion. And this is the explanation of the bubbly or frothy liquid. Boyle seems to believe that tangible matter, water or even mercury is a mixture which contains bubbles of air entrapped into it. When heated, for example, these bubbles attempt to expand and escape. As in the following experiment my, made by an eminent mathematician, possibly John Wallace, the editor says, and reported by Boyle in the same new experiments. Okay, I'm not going to read this, but you can, you can have a look at it. According to Boyle thus, enacting the Torricellian experiments necessitates a preliminary set of operations to extract entrapped bubbles from the quicksilver. But if mercury contains bubbles, this is even more true for common water. And indeed, if you look through the through Birch, History of the Royal Society, Philosophical Transactions and so on, it's striking how many experiments have something to do with extracting bubbles from water. Uh, the bubbly nature of water is investigated, for example, in connection with respiration, investigation on how fish, but also how ducks can breathe underwater. Um, and then there are other experiments which involves, of course, placing water, mercury and other liquids in the vacuum pump in order to free the bubbles inside it with or without adding heat into equation. An article published in Philosophical Transaction in August 1670 suggests, quote, some trials about the air, usually harbored and concealed in the pores of water, and proposes an instrument for detection and computation of this air which lurks into the water. The instrument consists of a globe of glass filled with water and a long pipe with a slender middle section and two larger sections in the upper and the lower end. The instrument is sealed and placed into the vacuum pump. It's heated and so on. And while the experimenter sort of observes the bubble formation. The idea seems to be to provide a kind of less breakable alternative to the bladder, to the very common device in which you have a glass of water and then you place a, 
um, bladder on the top of it and then the water evaporates and the, the bladder inflates. And uh, what is interesting is that in this experiment uh, recorded by the philosophical transaction, uh, there are proposed numerous trials, not only with water, but also with wine, spirit of wine, oil, and so on. So what all these experiments seem to suggest is that Boyle works with another intermediate level of or hypothesis or concept here, that of a bubbly or frothy liquid, assuming somehow that liquids are a mixture and they naturally contain bubbles extremely small, perhaps unobservable quantities of air, which upon the reduction of external pressure are released. Boyle describes the ascension of such bubbles and how uh, they grow as they approach the surface and how they become larger and larger just beneath the surface. And then when they get into the air, um, they also push the whole water down. All this is concerned with other Royal Society experiments to which if I have time, I will come back later. In any case, all these experiments look very different from what similar cases of hydrostatic and pneumatics that we have seen so far. They seem to assume some non-additional mechanical layers in the explanation of the spring. And they also assume that liquids and perhaps even solids incorporate air or spirits under the form of bubbles. Now, of course, let me propose here a different context and this is the Baconian context, because the, some of you are already waiting for Bacon to turn up if so many bubbles and spirits are involved. And I think that there is a turning point in the story, which again, here the year I'm becoming speculative, and this is the publication, ah, the publication in 1658 of the Historia Naturalis and Experimentalis, published in London under the supervision of William Rowley in the printing shop of Roger Daniel. And this is an interesting timing because William Rowley has published a lot of Bacon's works in 1627, well, starting in 1623 and then 1627 and 1629 and then 1638 and then nothing for 20 years. And then suddenly this comes on the market. And this is Bacon's most theoretically informed natural history, also the most edited and probably Rowley kind of reorganizing it had a very important, so Rowley had a very important um, role in, in reorganizing it. And uh, this is kind of the most transparent with respect to uh, Bacon's schematism of matter, rarefaction and condensation, and all sorts of other intermediate theoretical concepts. And as Rees has suggested, uh, Rowley might have reacted publishing this uh, work to the publication five years earlier of this one, uh, Grutter Scripta, an extremely interesting compilation of text containing Bacon's cosmological speculations, the clearest statements of his appetitive matter theory, a number of texts in connection with the more theoretical parts of the Instauratio Magna, here it is the summary, but also samples of experimental inquiries into the nature of light, and surprise, surprise, the nature of rarefaction. Because Gruta's scripture contains the Phenomena Universi, an early version of what would become in the 1620s, Bacon's natural um, and experimental history of dense and rare, and it contains a large number of uh, experiments with bubbles and bladders. Now, of course, all this was written way before the Torricellian experiments. Um, Phenomena University probably in 1611-12, Historia Densi probably in 1622 and 1623, so no inverted cubes, no not much mercury, but a lot of experimenting with bladders. One can perhaps say, I mean, if, if you know, if you are Henry Power, who was much more keen on reading Boyle, or someone else like this in 1658, one can say that bladders are Bacon's favorite instrument. And in Bacon's case, we have much more than analogy there because the Historia Densi and Rare, Rari, Historia Densi and Rari, states clearly that, quote, a bubble of water is also like a bladder, except that it's very fragile. 
Now, I, I'm not going to give you all the details of the history of Dancy, which is a very complex text and very difficult to summarize in the five minutes that I want to finish this. But, okay, the main points there is that his Bacon is trying to range all substances in a scale of the concentration of matter. Scala, coercionis materiae, on the basis of which one can attempt classifications of bodies. Um, and both the tangible and the pneumatic have to be kind of ranged in this scale, which is not one table, but tables of tables of tables. Um, similarly, so another very important thing is that Historia establishes that air is a mixture of pneumatics. Some are less rare, such as fume and odors. Others are more subtle, such as fire life or living spirits. The lightest and most active of pneumatics is the living spirit, sometimes described as a mixture of air and fire. And the experiments and tables in Historia Densiorari display this rich interplay of metaphysics and experimentation, perhaps even richer than what we have seen so far in the experimentation. There is a general metaphysical principle at work, the principle of the constancy of matter, the sum of matter in the universe is constant and no annihilation is possible. Every transformation and every process are mere modifications of configurations. Tangible matter becomes pneumatic and pneumatic matter gets rarefied and so on. And another important principle at work is that tangible matter contains pneumatics bound or trapped inside of every tangible body. And the spirits or pneumatics are light and active. But the most important thing is that the spirits are trapped in matter and they are very similar with the bubble model we have seen so far. And this is even theorized because then it's theorized in the concept of, of uh, folds of matter. So Bacon rejects atomism. That's already obvious in the 1620s in the Novum Organum. He rejects hard atoms moving in vacuum. And he argues for a sort of pliable notion of matter, materiam fluxam. To it, he opposes a dynamic to, to atomism, he is opposing this kind of dynamic conception of matter, whose primordial building blocks are what he calls the simple motions. So instead of being aggregates of particles, bodies are relatively stable configurations of motions. But this relative stability is in permanent jeopardy from internal and external forces. From outside, bodies are constantly hit by streams of rays, heat, cold, movements of the air, wind, influence, influences of other bodies. These external influences are often producing what Bacon calls the opening of bodies, namely the rarefaction. For within, bodies are equally consumed and transformed by spirits enclosed or trapped, which modify their configuration and sometimes also produce a process of pneumatization, something similar with rarefaction. How is this done? Well, this is done by the, in a sort of bubbly model by using kind of metaphysical concept brought to the level of intermediate explanations. And this is the concept of plica materia or folds of matter. Bacon is saying that obviously exists a fold of matter with which within certain limits coils and uncoils itself in space without vacuum interposing itself. So every time something is happening and the process begins inside or from outside, instead of having particles moving in a rarefied space, Bacon sees this frothy bubbly model. And what is important is that this in the Historia Densiorari is not like in the scripta, it's not metaphysics at work or it's not speculation. This is all part of 
or put in the service of experimental investigations. Scales of abundance and scarcity of matter allow the experimenter to reconfigure properties and definitions of a particular body according to its position in the tables and its relative position with respect to other bodies. In fact, what, the bo what is a body for Bacon is slightly different than what counts as a body for Boyle and Hooke. But this is not because of his internal composition. It's not because it's made of atoms or particles or anything, but because for Bacon, each and every body is in a state of permanent transformation. So if we want to place a substance on the scale of densities or rare substances, we have to ascribe to it not a point, but an interval. Say water or wine occupy a certain interval on the table of densities lower than lower, oh, higher than mercury, lower than the spirits if the table is vertical. In fact, in order to decide where to place a particular sample on this scale, it is not enough to determine by one single measure its density. Boy wants to add to the table numerical values corresponding to the opening of that particular sample because any sample is subject to these openings. It becomes more rarefied or uh, more concocted. Or, you know, it's, it's in a process of change. Attempts to open and distill, for example, produce often unexpected result. And uh, because most bodies are mixtures and contain these bubbles of spirit, their various opened and distilled states will place them upper or lower on the scales, on the scale of concentration of matter. So this is a whole science there of uh, classifying the bubbly matter on, according to density. And a lot of interesting things are happening there. I'm not going to enter into details, but we can discuss. The point is that Historia Densi Rari and the scale can give us a sort of instrument to range substances in some sort of order, while this bubbly model of the folds of matter give us some conceptual tool to explain the continuous process of change in the natural world. Whenever the external force is imposed upon a body or whenever the internal spirit prevails and aims to turn tangible matter into thematics, this attempt to break the bonding and continuity leads to the unfolding of plica materiae and the creation of bubbles. And this also explains why bodies are in the continuous process of expansion, more or less accelerated, but quasi irreversible. Momentary condensation can and do occur in Bacon's universe, uh, but they are rare and they require interventions from the experimenter. In naturally speaking, there is a continuous process of pneumatization and expansion at work, as in the title of Bacon's useful poem, the whole world is nothing but a bubble. Okay. Um, now, if I'm right, and if the publication of Bacon's Historia Densi represents indeed a turning point in the story I'm trying to tell here, one would expect to find some evidence of this in this new context of reading, trying and enacting experiments in the second part of the 17th century. And here I still have to do a lot of work because uh, to date no one has traced, to my knowledge, the reception of this very interesting text or the reception of Brutal Scripta. Um, in this paper, I have only shown similarities so far, and I only claim that, that reading these texts, more speculative Laconian text, offers us a sort of context in which we can think and enact imaginative, imaginary, we can do this imaginary enactment of the Royal Society's experiments. There is not yet a smoking gun here. I have some ideas where one can find a smoking gun. And as soon as the world opens, I know where to look for them. Um, but there are strong similarities at work here between Bacon's folds of matter and the persistence of experiments with bubbles and froth in the early royal society. Um, what we have seen so far is that they are connected with the general history of air and they play an important role in uh, an instrumental definition or operational definition of air. Um, 
in the 1661 and after that Hook is asked to draw a general history of air and here are some of the questions that the virtuosi try to respond in putting together such a such a natural history of air more interesting oops nah. more interesting are these what are its qualities and motion what it's spring or a later is how is it cause how is it caused the air is it an internal or an external cause and so on and one can see experiments in the royal society as attempting to respond to these kind of questions and the most interesting and i'm going to end with this are those who are producing air some are producing air from water okay we have seen already that we can do this but there are also attempts to produce air in ways in which we will call today chemical. Fermenting beer, no surprising, cider, so on. It's exactly the same. You put beer in the vessel, you put a bladder on the top of it, you shake the beer, the bladder inflates. Is it air in there or not? How do you test? You burn a candle, you try to breathe, etc. Even more interesting is the dissolving oyster shells or powder of oysters in aqua fortis. I suspect that that's a reaction between nitric acid and calcium carbonate. Again, you produce CO2, you don't produce air. The question is, is it air at the meeting of at that meeting of the Royal Society? Brunker said, well, if it inflates and accepts condensation, it must be air. Boyle and Hook adds to that that it needs to sustain burning and respiration. And this is incorporated in Boyle's general history of the air. First definition by the air, I commonly understand that seen fluid, diaphanous, comprehensible, and dilatable body in which we breathe and where we move, which, envelop, uh, which envelops the great height above the highest mountains. But yet, it is so different from ether that it reflects rays of light. What we have here is a theoretical definition. It contains theoretical terms and concepts, but is also an operational definition. Every each of these features of the air can be defined in an instrumental and experimental manner. I suggest that the resulting definition, this thing and the intermediate ones, are not really metaphysically engaged or metaphysically committed. They can agree with these working definitions even if one is a vitalist Baconian or a pseudo-Cartesian like Henry Power or a mechanical philosopher like Robert Boyle. And thank you. All right, thank you so much, Donna. We're very grateful for this moment of grace. And please join me in using the applause button. And if every friend of Cherkis were as generous as you were, we'd be skyrocketing right now. So thanks once again. Um, I'm very much hoping that there will be um, a uh, queue of uh, questions. Uh, so please make yourselves known by raising the virtual hand. Um, don't, oh, Dan, Dan, please go ahead. Thank you. Donna, that, that was really you know, quite fascinating. I have a lot of questions, particularly about sort of the interplay. Well, I'm interested in the interplay between um, um, the physical assumptions that people are bringing and the experiments that, they, uh, um, that they're doing. It's obvious that they have. You know, in a certain sense, you can think of them as testing hypotheses they're bringing um, a certain understanding of, of the physical makeup of the various components and how it is that they work to the experiments themselves. But um, I actually have a rather different question um, as well. Um, you're emphasizing the possibility of a Baconian influence through the publication of these texts at a crucial moment when um, um, when people were doing these experiments. But um, I'm wondering um, how that Baconian um, um, intervention, and you know, I'm convinced that there is something there. I think that that's very plausible. 
interacts with what has been, I think, the um, standard story or a more standard story up until now, which is the influence of um, 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 Pascal and his experiments and the debates between you know, uh, Pascal and the Cartesians over um, um, vacua and over the, um, um, the idea of air pressure and the, the sort of experiments that they were doing with, with that. How does the, this Baconian story interact um, with that? Yeah. Well, you, you have a lot of questions. I have a lot of answers to your question. <laughs> I wonder Good. how to begin. Let me no begin with a simple one. Let me begin with, with a kind of clarificatory thing. What I try to show here is following an interpretation which takes Pascal completely out of the question because Pascal and Stevin do not have elasticity or elator or spring. Right. They only have the weight. Okay, right. and this explain all these explanations have in common the idea that you don't have one force at work, but you have two forces, and these two forces are entirely different. If the first one is a force of classical mechanics, and can be, I mean, Archimedean, let's say, sorry, mechanics, the second one is not. And the second force, this elasticity or elator or spring or whatever, uh, power of rarefaction, doesn't act in the same direction as the gravity, okay? The weight acts downwards. This acts like this in all directions. Yeah. So how do these two kind of, how do you compute them? So my point is that boil spring of the air is not an answer to anything. It's reformulating the question into a research program that is very far away to the end of, of it, which has this problem. How do you compute two forces which are seems to be contradictory because somehow pressure acts from outside and this is a kind of elator. They don't have, you cannot just compute them simply. They don't have the same direction. Um, and uh, in addition to that, uh, uh, I wanted to say something and, and it, it went away. <laughs> there is something else to this. Yeah, okay, so people are saying good. Uh, so what happens when Boyle is kind of discovering the Boyle's law? He's bracketing the interesting question because what Boyle does is to put the tube horizontally. So Boyle's law gets into the picture when Hooks has this great idea to eliminate completely the weight from the picture by placing the tube horizontally. And then you don't have a problem of the weight of the air anymore. Then you have the elator, volume, and pressure. And you think but that, that, that comes from the plica materiae? No, that doesn't. I'm not. I haven't talked about this, and this is not part of my story yet. This is 1662. Boyle somehow concludes after Hooke's experiments and everything which has been done, and formulates something that to us looks like the law of gases. What I'm saying is that this is not part of the interesting story that I've been trying to say here to unfold before you. And the, the interesting part of the, the interesting part of the story is that the, the law of gases does not, does not reply to what is the elasticity of the air or how to compute the relative strengths of pressure and elasticity. Having Boyle's law doesn't respond anything to this question. That's one thing. The other thing is that, and here I see Bacon kicking in that Boyle is not doing the Torricellian experiment anymore. He's working with bubbles, which are the byproduct of, I mean, everyone wants to eliminate the bubbles. It's, it's, it's almost like, you know, it's almost like when Newton um, takes a feature of the experiments with uh, refraction that everyone thought it was a mistake, namely that the specter is elongated. No one bothered that the specter was elongated. And Newton said, that's the most important thing. I see here a similar move. 
boil suddenly becomes interested in bubbles in water, bubbles in mercury, bubbles in you know, frosty. These are extremely complex problems. Someone is still working today on the, you know, the science of bubbles in beer. You need very complicated mathematics to sort this out. Now, here is the coincidence. I mean, these people are Baconians in many ways. They are Baconians because they want to do and they claim they are doing Baconian natural and experimental history. They are Baconians because they read the Silva Silvarum at their meetings and I eliminated that. There are quotes in which they read about the motion of under pressure and the motion of liberty that you can find in the Silva. But in the Silva, you don't find this plica materia business, which squares very nicely with the bubble story. And it's a kind of coincidence that in 1658, you have this book on the market. And then in 1658, you have Henry Power working with Townsley on precisely these matters. And then you have Boyle working on this one year after. And then everyone is interested in this. And then the production of air kicks in. It looks like there is, a, there is, a, there is another addition to the Baconianism, which is a bit the more speculative Baconianism. So if I have to claim the Baconian context plays in three different levels. One is the well-known natural historical level, one is the methodological level, and here you have the more metaphysical level, namely that kind of Baconianism that everyone claims doesn't exist for the royal society. Just one brief comment that the Thika Materiae, which is in the Silva, is also in the um, Novum Organum, which is what your quotation was from. Um, yeah. Why did it? Why? Yes. Why wasn't it noticed before? Why? Why? What I'm, was? I'm sure it was the 1658 okay. uh, publication. I'm sure it was, but it wasn't. It, it's not that clear what is its business in the Novum Organum. In the Novum Organum, that quote appears in yeah. the motion of connection in the list of simple yeah. motions, and it's not illustrated by anything. I mean, this is a metaphysical concept. Bacon, Marta Fattori claims that Bacon takes it from Telesio. I'm sure there is a long story about where does Bacon take it from. But like with the concoction that he takes from Aristotle and completely change its meaning. The plica materia in the Historia Densi et Rari, it's one of the provisional hypotheses at the end. It's one of the canones mobiles, one of the provisional hypotheses on, under which we develop our research with bubbles or you know, with research with, with rarefaction and condensation is the fact that there are these folds of matter, which are a kind of requirement of continuity, a rewriting of a requirement of continuity. So here you have it, in a natural and experimental history, these people are doing natural and experimental history. This is not metaphysics because it's in the canones mobiles. It's nice, it's safe, you can take it, okay? That's, that's what, how I see things. And now, of course, the next step is to find some smoking guns here and yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much, Don and Donna for answering. Um, I. Um, I uh, would like to point out that uh, Dolores is very generous and deferred to uh, Monica and Stephen for them to ask their questions first before hers. So Monica, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Dana. I, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, and I'll, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I don't have any, I don't have like really like hard questions or something. I just would like to say the sort of things that I liked and the things that I found interesting. So one thing was um, when you imagine or when one tries to imagine what's going on in those, in any kind of description of the experiment, right? Um, you have to fill in some gaps. And I think that's where, you know, like the interpretation comes in. Like, you know, you as a historian of science, you, you start to fill in and think, okay, why is the bladder mentioned here? The pig bladder is mentioned here and we don't know exactly what is its role, right? Uh, but I think in each of these cases, because I do not have the whole, like the entire text in front of my eyes, I do wonder 
whether maybe there was something coming before that description, right? It's like people are saying, oh, and this thing is supposed to be showing this, or like they mentioned someone else doing the same experiment. That kind of gives you some insight in what they took the experiment to be, right? Because there's one thing to, for me to just zoom in on this passage and ignore what comes before and after, right? So I do not know the context for those, um, for those sort of experiments. So that's, that's one thing. Um, but I do think this is something that comes really nicely to the fore. And I personally don't know if I would like to focus so much on the, I mean, it's obviously Bacon has to play in the picture, but it's really interesting the way you brought in the fact that something that looks like a secondary aspect of the description, right? Those like the bubbles and how they show up, how they become important. So I I really like that kind of story when you're like showing there's like there's a focus on them that starts to pick up and you wouldn't see them. That's the thing is like if you just read the description, you wouldn't immediately think of the bubbles, right? So you had to enact in some sense in order to figure out that the bubbles are gonna show up there. <laughs> and then just not only showing up, but they've kind of become important. So I, uh, yeah, I, I really kind of like that project. So I, I, I think, and sometimes you might even think, I mean, there's the question of the choices that we have, like, so what are the choices in filling in the gaps in the descriptions or like, right, that kind of gives you more liberty in terms of metaphysics and so on and so forth. But then there's also the question of why bubbles do not show up in some descriptions. And that might also be, you know, like an interesting move to describe. But I, overall, I really like, I enjoyed this project. I'm really looking forward to read the paper. Thank you, Monica. I just wanted to tell you something about the level of details, because that's that's another thing why I think that I think it's very useful. I think it's useful to think to this. Uh, these are supposed to be experiments and they have been treated in the history of science as no, you know, clear cut experiments, the Torricellian experiment. It's a clear cut experiment. I, what I try to show you is how vague they are and how much they look like recipes and how much imagination you need in order to figure out what the hell is going on, what are the premises, what is the conclusion? I still don't quite know. Uh, it would be nice to try to reenact them and see what's going on and so on. I don't know whether that will solve all the mysteries, but my point here is that that was precisely how they themselves related. To, so when Pequet was reporting what Robert Wall said, and when the translator of Pequet was translating Pequet, and when Henry Powers reading this, they had the same problems. They had to imagine first and then try to perform next. And therefore their experiments do not, are never, uh, they're like enacting recipes. They are never identical. And every time you find new and nice details, I didn't, I took out Henry Power from the thing, but Henry Power insists that bladders have not, have to be wet and not dry. The fish bladder, if it is wet, then you can do it. If it is dry, you cannot do it. Which I wonder, you know, why again? I mean, one, one wonders what are all these details and in what way they are relevant. And they, they insist on this. So when it comes to the details and context, these recordings are rather scarce. They are very visual and they favor certain details. And a lot has been written on this. Some people are saying that, you know, this is part of the rhetoric of experimentation, that, you know, there's this kind of virtual witnessing theory that they are writing in such a way to make you feel part of the, the witnesses that are looking at. But my point is that these details are extremely vague recipe like and they leave a lot of latitude to the enactor to the experimenter and i think that that's relevant and i think that we lose this if we subsume them under big labels or experiments on this or experiments on that all right thanks so much monica and dana and our next question comes from stephen stephen please go ahead Even you need to unmute yourself. Sorry, I thought I had. <laughs> Thank you for that paper. It was very enjoyable. Um, there's a, a famous uh, 
cooking recipe by uh, Mrs. Beaton for jugged hare, uh, which begins, first catch your hare. Uh, and I thought this, this made me think of first catch your bladder, uh, which got me to thinking about uh, Domenico Bertolini Maley's book, Thinking with Things, and how um, objects, everyday objects become repurposed uh, for experimentalism. Um, and what it made me wonder was where do bladders feature in early modern everyday life in order to become uh, components in, in an experimental recipe? And I just wondered um, if you had any thoughts on that or whether you'd come across um, the place of bladders in early modern culture. And just your last description of the fish bladder and needing to be wet made me wonder about swim bladders and in fishes and whether that had featured in natural historical accounts in the 16th century. Um, that may be one of the reasons why they thought they ought to be wet. I'm not sure. Uh, certainly swim bladders were used, as I recall, in the production of finings in the brewing industry. Um, so they were clearly known in that area of everyday life. It's just an open question. Um, it seems to me it might be an interesting uh, route to follow, uh, to think why bladders, pig's bladders, goat's bladders, fish's bladders, and so on. Yeah, Stephen, you're absolutely right. I, I kind of started wondering seriously where to look first for this, because I haven't realized before I started really looking into the, after uh, looking two bladders. I haven't realized how widespread they are. I thought they are one of Bacon's peculiarity, then gradually dies out in the Royal Society. And I was very, very surprised to realize that they that this is not the case. And they feature so prominently in Boyle. I somehow didn't realize that. And I have no idea how to answer your question, whether they were what they were used for. Uh, whether I wondered, they were, I wondered yeah. maybe um, children's toys that for uh, because, sure, of yeah. Of course, traditionally, uh, I think uh, fools um, in courts used to have uh, inflated bladders on sticks, for example. So, I mean, mm -hmm. it doesn't seem like it's going to be an object which occurs um, in, in any kind of, uh, lo, lo, you know, work or, or productive uh, labor. I mean, it could be something as simple as that, um, in the same way that uh, Thomas, uh, Thomas Hobbes invokes uh, the, the child's pop gun um, mm -hmm. in one of his passages uh, before he gets really stuck into the idea of the air rifle as a, an occasion for experimental reflections. Yeah, well, Bacon quotes them in the context of children's toys in the Silva Silvarum. Now, I know that in the tradition, the folk tradition in Romania, they are used like football or whatever kind of balls, if they are large enough. So there was some sort of attempt to do that. And I suspect you can keep some liquids in them, such as wine. But that's another thing, because uh, there are, I found some experiments recorded in the history of the Royal Society which shows that some bladders are permeable to liquids, but not to all liquids. Now, one interesting thing that happens in the Royal Society is that they become interested in the anatomy of bladders and especially the anatomy of fish swim bladder. And they start looking how the bladder connects with the intestine of the fish and with the stomach of the fish. And they realize basically, I think Charlton is important here. They realize that that air is produced into that bladder, that there is a CO2, there's a fermentation process in the stomach of the fish or somewhere, I don't exactly know where, that kind of, I read, I read some anatomy papers, but I did that in a, in a kind of hurry, so I still have to, to think a bit about fish bladders, but they're extremely complicated objects, and they, they are permeable, they are impermeable to air, but they are permeable to certain gases. They even have a reticule of blood vessels in it. So yes, I think that, that it's, it's very interesting to look at, at how they become interested in this object as anatomical objects as well. And of course, at some point they realize that they can become um, 
how do you call them like oxygen uh, how do you call them this this um, you can you can use them for breathing underwater so in the royal society there are these attempts to use bladders for breathing underwater and then of course from here to artificial lungs is just one step so yeah it's uh, a yeah. but 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 I, I take your point that one needs more to know. One needs to need to know more about 16th century. I don't know uh, trades, and because where would I, that? That was one question that I was thinking in connection with bacon. I mean, he one needs a large supply of bladders, um, and you just go to the butcher to get the bladder, or you know, is there any supply of bladders in London in 1600? I don't know. All right, thank you so much, Stephen and Anna. And in that backdrop, Dolores, we're all yours. Dolores, I'm not here. We are not hearing you. You need to turn on the microphone. It, how about now? Is that good? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, um, as usual, I have a complicated question. So, um, um, so by my by my count, the first instance of the idea about um, bladders uh, comes in um, New Organ on um, uh, forty. Is that right? Book two forty. Um, I have no idea. Anyway, um, so it's it's um, it's a it's a, one of the prerogative instances, a, a summoning instance, and so if you um, if you cross reference. Um, um, Bacon's ideas of, of bladders with his ideas of bubbles. Um, I would not be, you know, you said that, you know, this is what you're doing is from the ground up. Um, so you really don't want to have to confuse your mind at this point with um, squaring whatever you're going to find with cosmological arguments. But, um, but actually, there's a huge literature on bubbles and bladders in, in the pre-Socratics. And um, if, you go to the, um, if you go to New Organ on um, 39, um, he um, um, talks about Democritus. And, um, and he doesn't talk about bladders, but he's, he's in this sort of vein of thinking about how can we think about the transformation from um, pneumatic matter to tangible matter and from tangible matter back to pneumatic? That seems to be um, a running thing in a uh, theme in the prerogative instances. And so um, if you do look in the, um, in the pre-Socratics about, um, about um, bladders, um, there is a, there's a wonderful, um, there's a wonderful, um, passage um, in there are passages in Plato's Timaeus about the about the beginning of the world and in Democritus, uh, the origin of mankind, you know, comes from uh, from the womb. But there's a theory of fermentation, um, which which gives back which gives birth to humankind. So we have the idea of um, um, the um, well, in Lucippus and Democritus, we have the idea that mankind arises from water and mud and the first men come out of the earth. And then like other animals, they owe their origin to life-giving moisture. And, um, and it is probable that they also held a theory of fermentation of the earth's surface and the production of bubble-like membranes inside which um, our wombs and the first living creatures grew. So I'm not saying, that Bacon thought this, but that maybe is something that you should look into because in my, in my um, reading of Bacon, I'm al always surprised how much he takes from the pre-Socratics. And that might be through Telesio or it might be through Lactantius or it might just be he's reading the pre-Socratics, I'm not sure. Um, so that's the suggestion that might not, might, might not have occurred to you. Um, the other thing that I um, that I would like to say is that because you, like me, are always looking for this line between 
um, Bacon's experiments or his suggestions of experiments and what happens in the Royal Society, especially with, especially with people like Boyle and Locke, et cetera. It's so interesting that it's very explicit what he's doing with bubbles and um, bladders in the new organon um, as, and uh, marking them as prerogative instances and giving them special titles. But when they show up in the Royal Society, that Baconian language disappears as a category. Uh, but the language of how he describes the experiment continues. So it's interesting that, um, that Boyle um, uses, uses Bacon as a kind of um, springboard for how to conceive of, of an experiment but doesn't import his entire um, um, categories of prerogative instances into the, in, into the language of the philosophical transactions. So um, I think you're right though, that you know, Boyle is obviously looking at, uh, at Bacon, both from the new, possibly the new organon and the Silva um, and the other instances of bladders and bubbles. Um, so that, I mean, if you did an exhaustive search of that, then you will, will have covered every base. Mm. Yeah, no, thank you, Dolores. There are plenty as, as there are plenty of things into your in your question. So I'm going to be selective and just respond to some. One is that um, the most interesting phenomenological description of a bladder experiment. Uh, it's already is, is in this Grutter script, is in the Phenomena University, where there are three very detailed experiments of phase transition using bubbles, which are tied up at the end of a, the neck of a vessel filled with respectively water, air, and spirit of wine, almost like the Royal Society experiments later on. And Bacon is describing the procedure that everyone uses later on. Namely, first of all, he observes how bubbles are formed and how the bladders inflate. Then he pierces the, bl the, uh, the bladder and then he waits, L let the, the steam goes on. And then he waits the two, the beginning, what is at the beginning of the experiment, what is at the end of the experiment, then first how much water was transformed into air, how much yes. wine was transformed into air. What is interesting in this is that is the detail of his descriptions which clearly focus on the formation of bubbles mm. and the different way in which bubbles are formed in different liquids. So in water, you have this constant stream of bubbles if you heat up water, while in oil, you don't have bubbles to begin with. And then you have at the end, these big yeah. bubbles that are kind of blowing off your pan, as we all know when we cook. Um, so he, it's, it's not just the Novum Organum and the Silva Silvarum and the Historia Densierari, uh, Historia Densierari, there are bubbles everywhere in Bacon. Also, and this is why I think that, that Stephen's suggestion is very useful and then I should look at the end of the 16th century, Bacon gives a recipe for making bubbles impermeable along the line of what I found later uh, treating bubbles in such a way that they become very, very good and impermeable leather or almost like very good and impermeable leather. And indeed that squares with the idea that you can use them on the top of a, of a tube as impermeable mm -hmm. material, but, but Bacon gives a recipe how to do that because they are permeable unless you treat them with oil and I don't know what. So, and he clearly didn't put that together himself. So he must have taken it from from some, someone who did it before him at the end of the 16th century. So there is a lot to be investigated into this. Um, I don't know about the language of the Royal Society. I mean, I have no idea how Boyle might have thought fit to translate prerogative instances, but he clearly played along with experiments of light and experiments of fruit and all the language, mm -hmm. different experiments. And they are working in the in the, you find in Birch all sorts of references to, to precise Bacon's text. That's why I'm saying I didn't just didn't have it didn't occur to me to look for for um, the examples of the Historia Densierari. I was always looking just for the posterity of Silva. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure that if one looks careful enough, one finds uh, precise details of of reenactment of experiments or. Or, or suggestions or recipes from these later works. 
So just one last thing, um, because I'm I'm working on medicine, I, I see things, I've got a, a medicine antennae. And um, what I'm impressed by is how both Bacon and the Royal Society um, are always um, seeing lateral applications of um, scientific discoveries about air or bubbles or um, uh, the dense than rare. And, and one, as I mentioned yesterday to you about cupping um, is really interesting because you get, um, um, because of course cupping is a, an ancient medical um, treatment, but, um, but Boyle is interested in cupping and uh, uh, members of the Royal Society are interested in cupping and people who in the 18th century, like Pringle, who is a, um, a medical doctor who ends up becoming head of the Royal Society, um, actually um, reading Bacon as a medical author, um, uses cupping in, um, in ex uh, experiments of field medicine. So, you know, it's and anything having to do with um, blood. So, of course, um, in the medical, ex nobody thinks that there are medical experiments on women in in the Royal Society, but if you do a list of all of the medical experiments at the Royal Society and you put them into categories, experiments on women become the most uh, the most prominent. And, and the reason that something like cupping becomes important for um, women's experiments is because it has to do with blood. So menstrual blood or, or the, the cleaning the toxins of the humors during a, a, a woman's cycle and that sort of thing. So so this this um, this idea about bladders and um, um, it, it turns into some all these different things because they're interconnected. So yeah, yeah. Thank you. We yeah. we have to discuss more about this. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Golovis, and Ariana is next. So Dana, thank you, thank you so much for, uh, as, as I obviously expected a, a really uh, exciting talk, brought me to a lot of ideas. Um, unfortunately, I'm not at all familiar with the specific experiments you discussed, so what I'm saying is just very much, uh, so very, very spe speculative. Um, first of all, I completely agree with you that um, discussing these experiments as examples of the Torricellian experiment or the Boyle's law just hides the, the, what, what it was about, let's say, in a sense. And uh, what I was wondering about the bladder is, um, it, I have the impression that um, possibly these, these bladders um, were useful for the questions that were asked in these experiments that um, were very much possibly about dynamics, about the behavior of the air, what it does. It com because of course, if you, you can, from our point of view, say you can test the Boyle's law in a static way, but actually it's different if you want to, um, to, to see the air expand and react. So this would be my, my very generic remark. And then um, from there, I was wondering, because you mentioned um, Bacon and then also Telesio and um, uh, the rare and the dense, and um, it, it, Telesio has, as far as rare and dense is concerned, a, a very complex classification of the different levels where it's, uh, it's, it, and it's very much linked to not really experiment, but, but really examples of substances that behave in strange ways when, when heated and when the cold and there are bubbles, there are very complex um, qualitative description, we would say, uh, but very much dynamical. So the, the, these, these levels of um, uh, rare and dense um, are very much linked to how a substance reacts to, to some stimuli. And it's, it's also linked to, to, to whether the, the substance is composite or pure, which is also not, not very clear cut, whether a constant is. And, and in this um, context, for example, I, one important reaction would be that the substance splits, for example, bubbles come out or smokes comes out or fumes. And um, so, my, and here comes my ignorance. I don't know how far um, this kind of experiments were taken up by Bacon. I, I know that there are some similarities there and, and might have, um, uh, have been 
some kind of inspiration bait for uh, also for Boyle. And but my point is, um, to me, the impression is really here. It's about seeing something move. This dynamic as these pneumatic experiments that you cannot really reduce to the mechanical thing. Or, or maybe Boyle tried to <laughs> with the atoms, but it's really uh, so. If you are trying to 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 understand how say a bubble or a void in, in, in the matter could could behave, then you really have a model of it with the bladder. Yeah. So that maybe the bladder as a model, this is really very, very far fetched. Okay, thanks. I stop here. <laughs> Thank you. No, I mean, Ariana, as usual, uh, your suggestions are extremely useful. I'm, I, uh, I, I don't know Telesio. That's my problem. So that's that's something I should discuss with you and with Dina and read more. Um, what I found as secondary literature on uh, Bacon and Telesio wasn't that helpful for what I wanted. But I'm sure there is much more, as usual, if you know where to look and how to look. So there is something, and, and for, I'm sure that, I mean, Bacon is assembling all his experiments from a limited number of books, and Alessio is among them. So you, are def you, mu you must be sure that, I mean, you must be, I mean, I'm sure you're right. Yeah. I, um, yeah. Yeah, sorry. I, I was not trying to push the ledger. It's more about the, the more generic idea of dynamics. Please, sorry, I interrupted you. <laughs> no, I mean, the second thing is, is you're absolutely right. So it's a physics of processes here. That's why it is so unfamiliar to us. But that's absolutely essential to Bacon. I always, to me, the big discovery while working at this paper was that uh, I always looked at the Royal Society and you know Boyle especially as getting out of this physics of processes into something much more you know a modern and law-like and states and particles having states and then collisions and so on. And to me, it was a big surprise to discover first uh, when we work with Juana on on Boyle and plants and chemical transmutation that that's not the case and there's a physics of process physics of processes in boil and now with this elasticity that again you have this rest in boils explanations that points towards a dynamic physics of processes uh, so i'm i'm thrilled but by <laughs> what i discovered while while working for this paper and i'm going to do more in this direction because that's precisely what but it's not always discussed when people are discussing Boyle. The, the, the extent to which his, his experiments are descriptive of processes unfolding in matter. Yeah. Thanks so much, Ayana and Dana. And as I invite people to uh, sign up for a new round of questions, I'm going to abuse my privilege as a chair and ask a question of my own, if I may. Um, so, uh, Dana, thanks so much. Everybody's been, and, and uh, starting with you yourself, have been um, um, incredibly historically careful. And so I'll just break rank and ask uh, the introductory epistemology question. Um, so you started out, if I remember, by um, saying that this project is at the crossroads of concept formation, modeling, and experimentation. Right, and then you distinguished between performative enactment and imaginary enactment. And so naturally, I wonder uh, what the wiggle room there is between, say, modeling and imaginary enactment. And if we can only imaginarily enact, if we use some models, do the models in question have to be physical or not? Could we uh, enact? purely, um, uh, uh, you know, just by fancy alone. So I just wonder if you could speculate a bit, right, uh, on that issue. I realize oh, the no. question is, is quite simple-minded, but that's the way it's intended to be. Yeah, but every time when I hear about models, I kind of freeze because this is such a complex and complicated and so modeling in a way subject that you don't know where to take it and how to relate to it. At some point, I was thinking of something else, which is uh, fictionalism uh, for this imaginary enactment. Uh, because again, if you think of, of recipes and, and, and unfolding and enacting recipes, you might think that you have a scenario behind them. But I don't know. So the simple answer is I didn't, I, I didn't think this way 
what I'm thinking, I so what what I what I'm focusing right now is on the on the preliminary levels of enactment, namely uh, the way in which a recipe is very context dependent and the way you think about it. And when I'm talking about imaginary enactment, I'm not talking about much. I'm just talking about how do you try to make sense of what you're reading? What are the steps? If I want to do this, okay? It's like reading a cookbook. If I want to do this recipe, what do I need? How do I have to assemble things? And then, and then I start doing it and modeling if there is any comes much later. And at this level, uh, the, the thing is very much context dependent. And I'm still struggling with this context dependency because if you read this in a you know, mechanical philosophy context and you don't even think of bladders, you think just of particles, then you read as people used to read Boyle and these experiments. And you are blind to the details or whether the cap of the Torricellian tube is elastic itself, which to me was, you know, when I read those things and I realized what I'm reading, I said, oh my God. So, you know, like I, f I felt cheated by years and years of historians of science who never pointed this detail to me, which I think it's an important detail. I just don't know why. So I'm, I'm still struggling with these kinds of, how do you tr try to understand a recipe in a particular context and which contexts are relevant and which are not. And I suspect that the next step would be to go into the direction of reproductions and understand more about how people when doing reproductions think in terms of modeling. I would say that that would be the way I would proceed. But yeah, that's just speculation as reply to you in, in reply to your oh, speculation. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. So thanks so much. And we have a new question from Professor Georgi Stefanov. Gigi, please go ahead. Um, thank you, Andre. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I hope it's okay. You can hear me, right? Yes. So yes. It, it's also related to a conceptual matter. Uh, uh, very nice presentation, Dana. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, my question is because uh, one uh, thing you also pointed out in the discussion seemed very interesting the difference between proper experiments, which are uh, repeatable, uh, and these sort of recipes. Well, I don't recall your term, but the distinction uh, seemed uh, quite interesting. And uh, my question is related to this distinction. So is there uh, something like a degree here, a degree distinction or, and when, because you know, even a recipe, a cooking recipe can be criticized if it's not repeatable, if you don't get, close enough uh, results to those advertised. And so how would you spell out the distinction a bit yeah. more? That's, that's all I wanted okay. to ask. Yes, so uh, that's, that's precisely what I want to do in this project. So ask me again in three year times. So let me give you some preliminary answer now, which is that um, there are degrees of uh, performing and enacting and then recording the recipes. Uh, and at the very end of this recipe tradition, you find something that we use, we call today or history of science called experiments. Now I was always, uh, I always had this, this question of what are the experiments? Usually historians of science are saying, well, you know, the event experiment, that's our model. The event experiment, namely it had, has happened and, and the whoever did it records the details, the time, whoever witnessed it, and all sorts of other things. And that's, to me, that's not very convincing because there are all sorts of details such as that added to recipes that do not make them very experimentally. So clearly there is something more, which is the connection with the theory and the kind of conceptual structure of the experiment. And without that, you don't have experiments. But at the level of, of what I'm talking here, which is a kind of pre-paradigmatic science to talk in Kuhnian terms, uh, it's very useful to think in terms of enacting recipes. Um, and in terms of degrees of enacting recipes. So for example, one thing I'm trying to show in my project is that not all enactments lead to experiments. Uh, 
uh, and, yeah okay so so some for example lead to what we call in the project a kind of technology which is a stabilized result and together with Juan Amate, we wrote a paper on cider as a spiritual technology and so, you know, making cider is a set of recipes that got stabilized people know how to make cider they do have all sorts of conceptual invention, instrumental invention, but there is no science of cider at the end of it. It's just a, a technological process. Right. But then there is a more sophisticated enactment. And here I'm trying to kind of put, I put forward these examples to show how sophisticated this enactment is, because this enactment doesn't aim at replication. Not, none of the experiments I give as examples today, aims to replicate anything. They don't even test, they don't try and test hypotheses. I don't think they do. They do something else. They do, I mean, they are similar with what Friedrich Steinle calls exploratory experimentation. They are playing around with condition, yeah. leading to the attempt to concept formation. And they come up, come up with these concepts, power of experimentation and later and so on which then becomes part of explanatory layers of theories and then presumably at some point theories are formed. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you've said a lot more already. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. All right, thanks so much, Gigi. And I wonder if there are any more questions? Uh, I can't help but notice, Monica, that you have a substantive comment in chat. Would you like to tell us a bit more about it? I don't want to say them aloud because I'm afraid that people who actually know a lot about the history of experiments, they're going to say, you're not saying anything new. <laughs> so I just put there in, in the chat some comments that I, I, you know, I, some ideas that I had was I was listening to people asking and then answering questions. So I think there is, you know, this is a site, this is where it gets very hard to say when you're trying not to use too much of the philosophy of science language, such as models, idealizations, and fictions. And at the same time, try to say something very, you know, extract something very interesting about what's happening in the description of the experiments or like, not even experiments of a situation of a setup where something happens, right? So it's it's a treacherous land to walk on, but I think that Dana is you know is kind of tr doing the right kind of work in you know this bottom up expression has to be done and it's relevant and we probably missed lots of things and we're probably missing lots of things in experimentation today as well. So it's not just about Boyle and <laughs> other people. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much, Monica. And I think we have a short comment from Dolores. Dolores, please. Um, yes. I'm, I'm, um, let's see. Can you can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. So, Donna, you say th um, you don't think that this is um, set up in in Bacon, at least, as something to be um, repeatable, but. Um, but he he takes great pains to to say that he's recording everything he does, that. Um, and that he's keeping very accurate um, tables and measures. So isn't isn't um, isn't that a, um, a? Yeah, thank you, Dolores. I know what you want to say. It's I didn't I I, I was using the term replication. So the okay. recording of the tables is not directing towards what we call today replication, which means certifying that he is right. The recording in this early modern experimentation books is directed towards teaching you how to go and do your own experiment and, and, and you know, go one step further. And Bacon is always adding this dimension that I'm, I'm recording these experiments just in case you want to try them and you know, become a Baconian or whatever, go and, and do the natural history of, of your own. And I think that this is valid for later uh, recordings as well. I don't think, it, it's a big question to me when replication, I mean, Dan had a, a long time ago, a paper on when replication began. Do you remember Dan? A lot, very long time ago, we had a discussion at New Europe College about how these papers were not directing tower, towards replication. And we had this question, and when did replication uh, began and I don't remember what you were answering there. Neither do I. 
Well, what, one of the so things not that... the obvious subject, not the obvious sub suspects. They are not. They are not replicating experiments. So th th that really. So there's a. So maybe one of the things that you should include in the experiment project is when replication is, um, is achieved or when replication becomes a goal. Because what I'm really struck by when reading years and years of philosophical transactions about a single subject is how people correct each other. So they're obviously, yeah. they're obviously- That's the language of, yeah, that's the language of trials and tests. So when they do trials, that means that they doubt that the report is correct. They doubt the trustworthy of the witness. Uh, and that's that's there already in the 16th century. De La Porta doubts a lot of things about what Aristotle is saying, and he's correcting them. But that's but not also, replication. But they also make suggestions about how to improve the experiment. Exactly. That's why it is not replication. Because nowadays, if you, if you replicate an atomic physics experiment, no one would ever dream of making suggestion to improve it. Replication means you replicate it and you certify that, yes, it works. You obtain this result. Well, while for the Royal Society and for this literature, the most important part is how you can improve it. Yeah, okay. As I hear your fantastic conversation, I can help uh, thinking that Stephen wants to jump in. So Stephen, please go ahead. Not so much uh, uh, of jumping in, but um, yeah. although I would ask, are there any bladders in uh, <laughs> Batista della Porta? That would be interesting. Um, no, I had a question about uh, why on earth you would put a carp bladder inside the bulb in the first place. And it seems you were talking about the relationship between the different layers, um, between metaphysical commitments and hands on doing. Um, and one of the things that come out of my own deliberations about um, air rifles and the way they're used in experiments was uh, are, were the air, was the air rifle something which caused people to think uh, and to, to come up with new concepts? Or, or was the air rifle simply an occasion um, to exercise pre-existing metaphysical commitments? And Hobbes does uh, exactly that. He uses the air rifle twice, once to prove that there is a void and once to prove that there isn't and can't be a void. So... <laughs> It seemed to me that he wasn't doing much thinking with the object. Um, he was merely imposing a kind of metaphysical interpretation on something. Um, and it seems to me you wouldn't go about putting inflated bladders in, uh, in the vessel, the bulb of a Torotelian tube, unless you had some pre-existing conception of what was in that bulb which um, inserting an inflated banner was designed to prove or, or disprove. So yeah, I, go, I guess I'm asking in which direction does the interaction between the layers go? Yeah, this is complicated, especially for that experiment. So as one possible answer is to reintroduce Pascal into the discussion, because in the pre de dome experiments, they're also carrying bladders up the mountain. And there are reports about the bladders becoming inflated. Um, and, uh, and Robert Wall has read those reports. And then he, if you think that he's modeling some sort of low pressure environment, then you think of him putting bladders inside. On the other hand, Robert Wall, of course, had a, a sort of more general theory where rarefaction played a very important role and active forces. And I suspect that you also read a bit of Bacon that I don't know, Vidu knows more about Robert Wall and can help perhaps here. But um, so therefore he, I mean, he must have been aware with the other uh, experiments with bubbles which had, which had something to do with the rarefaction of, with the process of rarefying water and producing rarefied air artificially inside of a bubble. So it's, it's much more than just um, one line of thought that can lead into the, into the direction of, of what is going on. My, in, in the paper, what I suggested was that uh, Robert Wall uh, did the experiment with bubbles and then thought, okay, how can I show this, that air expands more forcefully than water in such a way that no one contests is and, and then he 
he kind of find the kind of bubble that wouldn't burst because the bubble would be the obvious choice. People were already experimenting with bubbles, but pork bubble, pork bladders and, and whatever other bladders you cannot introduce in the Torricellian tube. And then he comes up with this weird object, the fish swimming bladder. Uh, and he claims that it's his own invention, that, that he was thinking what kind of object can be put there to show what he wanted to show, namely that the powers that, that the power of a of a bubble of air is stronger than the power of a bubble of water. That's what he wants to show, to say. So I don't think it's so much a question of what is inside there, but it's a question of what he wants. He wants to display the power of the air to uh, expand and produce visible effects. And he takes the bubble to be a, the, the bladder to be a, a display of that. But I really strongly doubt that that works. I'm going to try it. I don't have mercury. I'm going to try it with water as soon as I get to a laboratory. I don't think it can work. I just put a balloon under a, um, under a bit of water. It immediately bursts. Yeah, anyway. All right. Thanks so much, Stephen and Donna. Uh, in some mundane sense that's foreign to the love of wisdom, I think we're in overtime for about five minutes now. Um, but uh, if there are any, th this is the last call, right? So um, I wonder, uh, Dan, you've asked the first question and then you've been inordinately quiet and, and shy. So I wonder if you'd like to have a last comment. Um, sure. I've been thinking about, and this has been a marvelous discussion, a marvelous talk. <clears throat> but just to pick up on, um, one thing that Donna said was that these sorts of experiments are pre-paradigmatic in the Kuhnian sense. And um, they involve, and they're connected with concept formation. For example, the, the idea of the spring of air. Um, the, I, I take that that's an example of the kind of concept formation. <clears throat> that comes out of this. But I'm, but at the same time, um, you linked that to Bacon and some of his speculations. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering whether, I'm beginning to wonder whether the concept of sort of pre-paradigmatic is so clear. Um, I yeah, no, so sorry for introducing Kuhnian language. I couldn't resist. No, 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 that's okay. That's okay. I think it's, it, it, it's, it, it sort of stimulates one to sort of think about this. You know, I'm wondering, when you look at so many of the Baconian experiments, um, he is bringing um, certain ideas, at least, about um, um, matter and spirit and how it is that that works into the formulation of, of, of the, the experiment, which relates back to Stephen's question about um, you know, the extent to which these are really experiments of discovery as opposed to illustrating. And in the- Yeah, I, I see what you mean, yes. I see what you mean. Uh, sh the short answer is that when, that Bacon himself has these layers. So what I right. see in Bacon is that the fundamental metaphysical engagement for Bacon are the two quaternions of matter, the sulfurious right. and the mercurial, not the spirit and the tangible. The spirit and the tangible are this kind of very general operational concept. And that's precisely why Boyle and Henry Power are talking about spirits when they're talking about you know, plants or other things or mercurial experiments. They take the, the concept of spirit because it's not metaphysically charged. My claim is that plica materia is of the latter kind. So it's, it, it's an operational concept. It gets operationalized. Although its root is in metaphysics, yeah. he takes it in the Historia Densiari because it's not metaphysic. Yeah. So what I see- My point, here, my point is, is, more, is more general than that though that you're always bringing some, something that is- Theoretical, yeah. Something that is maybe 
physical, you know, how you characterize it. But at the same time, the working with it in practice, new concepts can arise from old. You're never in a certain sense starting from scratch. But yeah. on the other hand, there is the possibility within these experiments of um, finding something new, not only yeah. but also conceptually. Yes, you're right. The, and, and Stephen, that's exactly the same example. Yeah, the flame in a flame. And that's also an example that so, Royal Society takes over and they, they struggle very much to reproduce and then succeed. That's a very difficult experiment. Um, and Monica, to your question, the, the whole point is that the bladder shouldn't be completely empty and shouldn't be completely flat. It has to have some air in it. And that's the bubble that has to burst <laughs> or, you know, go up in the... So that's, that's the tricky thing. If it would be completely flat, then the experiment would be possible, but then it wouldn't inflate on the top. But we can never make it completely flat, right? So that's, that's the, the thing. Yeah. Like... <laughs> physically yeah. right so you you try to get it as little as possible but even when it's as little as possible it still has the possibility of expanding yeah but the point is how to put it under a big column of mercury and it doesn't burst that's the you see what happens we have donna give a talk and then suddenly this starts a conversation and it's fantastic so this is this is this is amazing um i very much hope donna that there will be new installments to this and that um you will uh, bring forth new presentations and new experiments to enlighten our evenings this has been quite fantastic so please join me in thanking donna and i will be using the applause button once again thanks Thank you so much. Thank you all and apologies for taking so much of your time with my bladders and bubbles. <laughs> just, just, just as a footnote, um, the er, uh, uh, early sources like Hero um, are using um, bladder experiments I'm and Dela look at it. And, yeah. Dela, and Dela Porta is citing Hero, so um, etc. Yeah. So it's yeah. not, it's yeah. not, um, if Hero is already using bladders for a pneumatic experiment, then uh, the suggestion of looking at the pre-Socratics is not completely um, out of the question. So, thank you, Dolores. Okay. Thanks so much, and thanks everybody. Good night. Have a good night. Bye.